Okay, everyone, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Nadia Al Ali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this semester's first um, lunch seminar organized by the center. And um, we are very happy to welcome our new colleague, Professor Mohammed Amar Mezian. Mohammed holds a PhD in philosophy and intellectual history from um, the University of uh, Paris 1, one Pantheon Sorbonne, and he recently joined Brown University as an assistant professor in French and Middle East studies. Um, so before joining us, uh, Mohammed taught for four years at Columbia University. He is the author of The States of the Earth, An Ecological and Racial History of Secularization, which won the Albertine Prize for Nonfiction in 2023. His second book is titled At the Edge of the Worlds Towards a Metaphysical Anthropology. And currently, he is working on two book manuscripts, the former examines how Orientalism shaped the intertwined histories of anti-metaphysics and human sciences from the 19th century on, and the latter on North African philosophies of decolonization. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming Mohammed. Uh, I should say, so he'll be speaking for about 30 minutes, and then we have time for a Q&A. Okay. Thank you. Okay, hello, everyone. Um, and thank you, Nadia, for this introduction. And, and thank you, I mean, I would like to thank, you know, the, the Center for Middle East Studies for this um, invitation. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's open. It's just that uh, I probably need to speak a bit more, you know, um, to be a bit more focused. Um, and of course, you know, thank you all for coming uh, to today. Um, in 1903, the Tribunal of Algiers published a ruling, more precisely on November the 15th. According to this uh, ruling, an indigenous subject in Algeria who converted to Catholicism or Christianity was still under the jurisdiction of repressive tribunals. The word Muslim or Arab therefore signified a vulnerability to the arbitrariness of the state's racial violence beyond any belonging to the Ummah or profession of divine unicity known as Tawhid. I want to begin with this seemingly marginal experience with the case of these rare indigenous subjects who converted to Christianity and the legal troubles they provoked in colonial Algeria. This trouble exposes the reality of race and its relationship to what I call the inconvertible. The rare colonized subjects who converted to Christianity despite the colonial administration's effort to limit missionary activity and sometimes in fact to uh, forbid missionary activity, these rare subjects were defined by the court as Catholic Muslims. This case signals with a revealing strangeness how race was spoken and deployed through the leg legal designation of the entire population as Muslim, at least after 1870 and uh, the Decret Crémieux. Contrary to what might be expected, the law's secularity seems precisely to have made religion into something its members did not have the right to abandon. By their very marginality, the Catholic Muslims of Algeria demonstrated that conversion to Catholicism did not function as a vector of assimilation through which, by proximity to whiteness, an indigenous subject could try and escape colonial status. Muslims would henceforth remain Muslims so that they could be kept within the racialized status of colonial subjects. And it was secular law, liberated from God or the church, that effected this legal fixation of religion by race and of religion as race. Through the marginal example of these indigenous Christian Muslims, racialization was materialized and appear as being materialized as an impassable limit. <clears throat> 
But for religion to be racialized, it had to be fixed in the law of the empire as something other than a metaphysical act of faith in the invisible, known in Arabic as al ghaib The phrase Catholic Muslims testifies to the presence of the racial at the heart of a so-called religious fact, whose limits and nature were produced and transformed by colonial power itself, a set of transformations that one might call secularization. The state could deploy racism without ever naming race as such. Hence, I want to argue that this colonial racism historically precedes biological racism and is not reducible to it, which one me, what which might be one of the reasons why it's still alive today. The key question of how juridical religious spaces in which one could, in fact, include the colonial constitution or reconfiguration of Islamic law, the key question of how these religious spaces are racialized by colonial power is generally absent in dominant analysis of race and colonialism, especially in the field of what is called Middle East studies. The redefinition of Islam as personal status, a typical effect of the secularization of law in many places in the Middle East, was the foundation of race in the economy of the French colonial state in Algeria, and this happened long before Egypt was in fact colonized in 1882 by the British. This mutual transformation of on the one hand, the very status of law, and on the other hand, the very status of Sharia, becoming Islamic law, is thus an outcome of what I would you know, like to call, or and this is a, um, something you know, I would like to discuss with you, the imperiality of secularizing processes, of which this transformation is both a phenomenon and a clue or indication. Race, I want to propose, thus appeared in this colonial context as the limit to all conversion as the word Catholic Muslims testifies. That race was created by an assumption of the other's inconvertibility is testified by the supposedly impure blood of the Jews and the Muslims who converted to Christianity during and after the Reconquista, a few centuries uh, earlier. The laws of blood purity, which were instituted by the middle of the 15th century in um, uh, Spain, therefore before the colonization of the Americas and the transatlantic slave trade, constitute what I would like to call a matrix of race, not only in the Middle East, but globally. Race, in fact, was born during the Reconquista under the figure not only of blood, but of blood as the inconvertible or as inconvertibility. It was less generated by a sort of internal logic of Christianity than it was generated by the Crusades Roman imperial Christian logic of either murdering or converting infidels, a logic that was reconfigured by the Spanish Empire and to some extent led to a certain kind of internal crisis of a specific form of not Christianity but Christendom by which precisely uh, one should mean something else than simply Christianity. Its first victims, as we know, were the converted Moors of Muslim Andalusia, whose destruction was the womb of the Spanish Empire and the conquest of the Americas in 1492. Starting by the end of the 18th century, the secularization of this imperial Christian matrix unfolded against the backdrop of this conception of race as inconvertible blood. Secularization took place once the inconvertibility of the so-called Muslim or Arab fanatic gave way to a new and deliberate refusal of conversion to Christianity, thus engendering, and this is new, a colonial strategic and conscious non-conversion of the native. That is to say, the colonial empire stops converting. Its most famous name is none other than the civilizing mission, which in itself is a, you know, a gesture of secularization, of course. The figure of secular conversion, conversion not to Christianity anymore, but to civilization by which uh, um, these you know, uh, colonial administrators mean extractive modernity. 
The strategy of non-conversion to Christianity had already structured the expedition to Egypt starting in 1798, and it was later on at the heart of the colonization of Algeria during the 19th century, where it determined the structure of a settler colonial state that was precisely implemented there. The idea of civilizing the indigenous populations of Algeria was materialized in a colonial state that tried dialectically to articulate two types of government, a direct form based on the massive expropriation of indigenous land by settlers in the urban areas, and an indirect form based on strategic respect for customary chiefs, traditional institutions, traditional religions in the rural areas, including, of course, the Sahara. Saint Simonianism, a French utopian movement quoted by Marx, in fact, in the manifesto, that was at once liberal and socialist, religious and secular, religious and industrial, played a key role in the articulation of this model of the colonial state, redeploying the project of the failed Napoleonic expedition to Egypt. The Saint Simonian program of association which you could translate as indirect rule, but actually emerged to some extent before indirect rule was deployed by the British in the uh, um, African continent. This program of association contributed to founding this two-faced state. It assigned the indigenous subjects their place in a racial economy based on the productive utilization of their supposedly natural capacities. This colonial racism can be named apartheid, apartheid in North Africa, which to some extent emerged before apartheid in South Africa. This colonial racism valorized each race's essential aptitudes while at the same time it declared the dogma of their perfectibility. Coming after the Crusades, the civilizing mission in Africa, and therefore also in Ifriqiya, or what we call North Africa, was meant to liberate people whom slavery had made unworthy of being truly human, or so precisely imperialists would say. No longer content to exclude them from humanity, it continuously prescribed how they would and should now be included within humanity and freedom, of course. They were promised earthly redemption and renewed dignity by empires who spoke only in the name of liberty after reducing millions of black men and women to slavery. But the arrival of this redemption and dignity on earth, subject to stringent conditions, was constantly and indefinitely deferred. The space of the colony unfold unfolded in this time of infinite latency, suffocating the colonized, obliging them to breathe an unbreathable air, and constraining them to live as humans already condemned to death, but constantly promised life, equality, freedom. Imaginary inclusion functioned as social debt. What would qualify a subject to become human free and a citizen also disqualified their existence. But what made them unworthy to become citizens imprisoned them within a tradition that had been reduced to the arbitrary rule of ossified custom, this is what is called customary law, and expropriated their lands, subsoils, and knowledge as it did their dignity. The double consciousness that haunted the colonized and still haunts their descendants, the impossible pressure to assimilate to whiteness if they cease to claim tradition, and of being pinned to a fixed identity if they claim these very traditions, this impossible pressure was the psychic effect of a doubling that has to be located at the very heart of the colonial state. It's not just psychic. It has to do with sovereignty. What, hap what appears here, therefore, is the double face of the Leviathan, the imperiality of the biblical monster, which, since Hobbes, of course, is often identified with the state itself. But this Leviathan in the colony is a Jan Janus Leviathan. The policy of association, or you know, indirect rule, formulated during the military colonization of Algeria, that is to say between 1830 and 1870, was in many respects an empire of the customary. 
as the structure of a form of apartheid in North Africa, it deployed a system of government comparable, though not identical, to what the British would ultimately put in place in their African and Asian possessions, including the Middle, the Middle East and South Africa. Sp spatial separation of populations based on race, together with indigenous tribes governed by control and support of their customary chiefs. In Algeria, they were called Qaids. But the crucial difference between apartheid in North Africa and in South Africa was that in the former, the race of the colonized was the same as their religion. As the Sharia had been reconfigured and sometimes, not always, codified by the empire as Islamic law under the model of Napoleonic civil code. The colonial practices elaborated by the French Empire in Algeria were established to counter the numerous uprisings against the French army of Africa, l'armée française d'Afrique. So I want to talk about these insurrections. Um, these uprisings um, organized you know, from the 1830s on through networks of solidarity, or what even Khaldun would call Asabiya, these networks of solidarity went beyond the tribal unit, or you know, what one might call them collectives. And these networks, uh, or rather these insurrections that they made possible, did not use the language of nationality or nationhood to describe their developing unification. In fact, what you find in the colonial sources is that the French colonizers say about uh, these, say, intertribal resistance that they, they are the slow emergence of an Arab nationality, right? So it's more complex than just saying that there is no nation. It's a bit more complex. The most famous of these was the insurrection led by Amir Abdul Qadir. Coming from a noble family in the west of the country, Abdul Qadir was a Sufi and a disciple of Ibn Arabi, which basically means that he was a philosopher and a metaphysician, not just uh, some sort of mystic or whatever. Far from wanting to be a conqueror or to wield power, he was elected by a group of collectives without having put himself forward, the contrary of our uh, liberal elections, after his own father had refused leadership of the resistance movements against colonial occupation. His abilities, rather than his ambition, were what destined him for the role, and tradition obliged him to consent to taking on the functions of Amir, a little bit like in the Republic of Plato. Abdel Qadir deployed a set of essentially guerrilla military tactics. His technique consisted in never remaining static, maintaining constant movement that short-circuited the enemy's targeting skills and working in alliance with the environment or climate. In a letter to General Bugeaud, so he was you know, in charge of the, the colonization, <coughs> he described the, this you know, principle, but in fact I should say that um, the archive we have, uh, to my knowledge, is not clear whether who's the author of the lines I'm going to read. So some people say it's Abdul Qadir, but in fact, the general himself says that it's uh, a few followers of Abdul Qadir themselves, uh, probably um, tribal chiefs, but in fact, uh, leaders of their own collectives within the larger collectives. So here's the quote. We fight when we deem it appropriate. You know that we are not cowards, end of quote. By choosing when to confront the enemy and refusing to be hemmed in, Abdul Qadir and or his followers saw the war neither as opposition to colonialism nor as a conflict between forces, as Western dialectics uh, would uh, put it, which is the sort of alternative that you still find at the very beginning of The Wretched of the Earth of Franz Fanon, right? former being Hegelian, the other one we don't really know, maybe Mao or, or Lenin, the conflict between forces. For us to confront all the forces, this is not me, this is the quote, for us to confront all the forces that march behind you would be folly. 
but we will exhaust them, we will pester them, we will destroy them selectively, and the climate will do the rest. End of quote. Working together with the climate and allowing it to work, this mode of struggle involved interaction with terrestrial forces, but also celestial forces. The Amir described the entire colonial wave, and this is not a metaphor, to Bujo in these terms. I quote from him. Do you see the wave that rises when a bird brushes it with its wing? This is the image of your time in Africa, end of quote. The Emir's resistance, and we should say the collective of the collective's resistance, was a permanent movement always ready to deploy and redeploy itself in different territories according to its own insurrectional needs. After its defeat, which in fact is a surrender, and not a surrender to the French, but a surrender to invisible forces, which notably involved the French side failure to respect the treaty, the treaties in fact that had been signed, the most famous of them being the, the Treaty of the Tafna, Abdel Kader's resistance was succeeded by a multitude of other attempts such as the ones led by Mahdi Abu Ziyan or al mukhrani The policies of segregating Muslims and Arabs, this is my point, the policies of surveilling their activities, in other words, colonial apartheid, was established to counter these uprisings. They were seen, maybe they were, a permanent threat which the colonizers referred to systematically with the racialized term fanaticism. To use the use, the usage of this word had been generalized by Volney and the French Enlightenment, who in fact, uh, Volney is the, the um, person who inspired the expedition to Egypt, in, in, uh, which like, took place in 1798. And it let the military uh, reduce an eminently complex discourse, metaphysical, terrestrial, ecological, if you may, to a vague idea of religion. The col colonial government's opposition to Christian missionaries largely derived from the terror aroused among the settlers and among the administration um, itself, because this is not exactly the same, by the supposed fanaticism of Arabs and Muslims. The prohibition of Christian missions during the first 20 years of the conquest was not a result of a direct transfer of the French imperial state to the colony, nor of a linear process of secularization that began in Europe and then spread in Africa and the Middle East. If colonialism was secularized on the ground, this developed through the modes of violence exercised against anti-colonial metaphysical uprisings and then the stabilization of counter-insurrectional war by an institutional mechanism that operated through law, which is what I call, in this case, apartheid. Racist discourse could then ascribe fanaticism to the supposed manifestations of the Arabs' naturally violent character inherent to their race, a discourse that, of course, legitimized the expropriation of their land. Massive, of course. Indirectly penetrating indigenous society through colonial ed education, and more specifically the instruction of women who were seen as a strategic point of entry to the secret space of the so-called Muslim family, which is also what is meant when one talks about Islamic law as personal status. So the private is not the individual, it's the family. And it's the case in France at that time too. This gesture uh, was typical of, of the type of colonialism I'm trying to describe and which I think is in fact emerging in Algeria. That is to say it's quite new, right? And you might call it a secular form of colonialism, but it's better to keep the word secularization because it's in, it's, it, it refers to a dynamic, to a set of processes. They don't always go in the same direction. There is no teleology. 
rather than saying that um, uh, the secularity of colonialism would be a stable e entity. This is why I never reduce uh, imperial secularization to either Christianity or secularism, because these are two stable entities, which is the reason why I think we should change the terms of, of, of the debates. Um, uh, quite famous debates in the Middle East studies uh, um, a little bit, right? I mean, we should change them a bit. These approaches, uh, colonial approaches, I mean, operated as a machine for producing signs, not only deciphering signs or deciphering indigenous practices as signs, right? The machine for producing signs was born of the colonial will to master appearances, right? That is to say, colonialism always think and is quite obsessed by how it appears, how uh, the so-called natives see them, which is sometimes called colonial dignity, basically, right? Or what colonizers call dignity, which is also one of the reasons why um, uh, European women were, were, were not allowed to come in colonial spaces for quite a long time during the 19th century. Um, not only did colonial um, education have to present a religiously neutral face to Muslims and Arabs, but in fact, secular education also had to appear to Christians as Christianity and to Arabs and Muslims as secular, right? It's a double, fa it's a double, it's also Janus faced, uh, uh, um, entity, right? Meaning, of course, that you can't decide uh, whether one face is the real one, right? Of course, it uses both, and if, if it can use both, this is also why it has power, right? Hence the fact that it's neither secularism nor Christianity, and it's both. And of course, if you reduce this to Christianity, uh, the problem is that uh, you, um, you, you, you don't allow yourself to see how colonialism operates, and, and to some extent, you 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 don't make yourself a, a, a able to critically, in fact, examine how colonialism functions, right? Which is a form of erasure. To understand how the colonization of Algeria was a, was a gesture of secularizing empire, to understand this requires an examination of the conflict between secular power and Christian institutions, the conflict, not an essence or an entity, as well as the multiple spaces in which these conflicts took place. Okay, so I'll, I'll just say one word and uh, open up for the discussion so that I, you know, I might uh, be proud of myself because it's like 30 minutes. Um, three, just three? Well, I will take less. Uh, by simply saying something, um, because if I, if I try and say more, it was going to be more than, than three minutes. Um, something about area studies. If I have to give a conclusion to uh, this talk, I would say that to think about race in Middle East studies, we have to rethink race beyond Middle East studies. That is to say, we have to at least challenge the boundaries between Africa, Ifriqiya, by which I mean North Africa, if you like, and the Middle East, at least. But also between the production of blackness, indigeneity, indigeneity sorry, and Arabness. Um, this is why, in my view, one has to work on chronology and, in fact, to multiply chronologies without assuming that 1492 would be the sole beginning of colonial modernity. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mohammed. I am going to open it up. Before doing that, I will... Um, I will start asking you some yes, questions. Yes. So um, I actually want to go back to your conclusion. But before doing that, I was wondering in terms of parallels. I mean, immediately when I'm thinking about sort of 
racialization of a religious group, um, Jews and Judaism comes to mind. So I was wondering whether I can speak, or reflect a little bit about parallels or differences. Um, but I really, I'm very much interested in this um, conclusion and about the wider debate in terms of Middle East studies as an area studies and how it relates or is in tension with um, the study specifically of blackness, blackness and um, African-American scholarship on race. Because I've had discussions with colleagues, I mean, I, you know, I, I guess I sort of wonder, so how translatable is this? Because one of the things that I learned coming from, from the UK to the US that um, you know race has a very specific meaning and a very specific context and there is sort of a sense of um, what are you do you Middle East studies scholars doing with race and you know going back to arguments about uh, well if you look back at the transatlantic uh, slave trade and the scholarship um, you know the the West Africans who are forced into bondage where always thought of as heathens and black, and that's a kind of that combination, then that's what race makes out. But also in terms of being in the US today, um, you know, the contemporary experience of being racially targeted is much more flat-footed. I mean, it's still linked. I mean, that's the argument so that it's, you know, linked to the color of your skin and that race means something very specific in this country. and who are you, who are we, to try to unsettle that? And so I'm having these conversations with colleagues and I'm sort of sharing that and wonder what your reaction would be if confronted, and I'm sure you have been as well, having worked at Columbia for four years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have not really, yes. I must say, but uh, I've been teaching on Fanon and, and, and therefore, um, had this conversation, but but not quite in the in the in the maybe the same terms. Mm -hmm. But yes, of course, I see what you mean, and this is a uh, you know fundamental question. Um, I don't know. I mean, how to answer that? Uh, and you know, there is no. I you know, I can't sort of give a, a exhaustive answer or something. But I'm thinking about uh, different references. Mm -hmm. um, The constitution of either indigeneity or blackness as evil, right? Mm. It has something to do with the long story of the Crusades, right? Mm. Um, it's not to say that there would be a primacy of one form of racialization over the other. It's just a way of saying that um, establishing two um, uh, strict boundaries between uh, interconnected histories mm -hmm. doesn't allow us to see history precisely, mm -hmm. but doesn't also allow us to think of um, overlapping strategies politically, in my view. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, the thing is that, you know, here we're in the US, but I was not um, trained in the US, mm -hmm. but I also didn't grow up in the US, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I guess this, um, my most uh, honest response would be that I'm trying to make sense of the kind of, of racialization that uh, uh, people like me and, and many others have faced in Europe, mm -hmm. and more specifically, of course, in the Francophone world, and more specifically in French, mm -hmm. in France, but you could even say more specifically in Paris. Mm -hmm. Now there is um, one very central, because of course, you know, from the point of view of America, France is like the province or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But, but the problem is that uh, there are very central um, um, sources of, you know, critical race theory and so on, such as Fanon, for example, who is completely connected to this specific context, mm. right? Mm. So, of course, you might say Fanon doesn't talk about the racialization of Islam as such. This is true. Mm which is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this um, uh, historical work, but what he talks about is the result of this process. Mm -hmm. And never does Fanon um, um, construct uh, 
precisely uh, boundaries or frontiers between different experiences of racialization. And he says quite explicitly, and I tend to agree with him, that the very fact of creating these rigid boundaries between forms of racialization is precisely what colonialism uh, does and how it likes to operate, mm -hmm. right? Which is also the reason why uh, I think that theorizing race without theorizing colonialism mm. is, uh, is problematic mm. because it can lead to, it can be very interesting, but it mm. can sometimes lead to, um, if you'd like, inscribing the analysis of racism into a liberal agenda, which mm. is in fact connected to mm. the very production of racism. Mm. Um, yes, this is what I would say. What about the issue with um, the parallel with uh, Jews being racialized? Well, the thing is that for me, it's this much more than a parallel, right? Mm. I think this is in fact the same, mm. the same process as I was trying to yes. argue, right? Yes. You can't really. Yes. Yeah, okay. even in Algeria, of course, yeah. as I mentioned, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, let's open it up. I'm going to take a few questions or comments. Going to take a couple yes. Um, so there was a question. Um, it's going to be here. Do you have a question? No. Okay. Uh, Ayala, you want to follow up with? Uh, 
questions, sir? Yes. So it, it, it's more of a more of a, more of a comment. Funny, thank you for this talk. And I read last night. I would never have heard this talk before I got here. But now I, I realize it's all the work of course and motivation. And it, I don't miss. I don't miss. Thank you. Okay, would you like to go before I'm going to ask some more people? Yes, 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 sure. I'm um, going to try and be quick. Mm -hmm. um, well, yes, convertibility and this notion of, of inconvertibility is, is uh, has two meanings. It's, it's about being not convertible. And when I was talking about inconvertibility of blood, it's just the fact that um, you, I mean, Christians convert. They, 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 they ask people. They ask, um, um, you know, more, so to speak, as they say, Jewish and Muslim uh, uh, people, to convert to Christianity. Right. So, if you're a good Christian, they're supposed to be just Christians. Right. So you have a sort of internal contradiction: is that well, maybe they might be something else. They might dissimulate something, which means that race emerges in this context as. Um, um, this thing that makes you not quite convertible even when you're, in fact, a convert, right? So it's not an absolute inconvertibility, hence the fact that it's a dialectical, if you like, process in the sense that, of course, uh, there are instances where subjects suddenly become converted. But convertible to what? Right, as you, as 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 uh, we said, uh, it's different to be convertible to uh, uh, Christianity as such than to be convertible to civilization. Right um, now, of course, convertibility also means, and therefore, inconvertibility also means that certain languages cannot be completely converted. Right, in 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 the second meaning of the word, into. Uh, um, you know, what the French would call a logiciel, right? A framework, right? And there is something, an untranslatability in the frameworks, for example, deployed by Abdul Kader, for example, into, uh, if you like, the French languages. And Abdul Kader, when he surrendered and was imprisoned in, in fact, Amboise near Paris, um, started writing, I mean, started writing, but also meditating, and then he, in fact, wrote philosophical treatises, metaphysical, beautiful metaphysics, in fact. Um, um, and I think even though he was admired, in fact, by the French, completely admired by the French, right? He was a sort of saint of the time, of the 19th century. He had all the honors, right? But, however, there is something that remains incomprehensible by, by the very people who admire him, right? So this is also inconvertibility, which is also a way of saying that race, in this case, is not just a projection or something purely mental or a discursive construction, right? Um, so that's the first thing. The second one, um, the only thing I want to say about the, the Cremieux decree, right? So the, the fact that the, the, um, the, the French state um, granted citizenship to the Jewish populations of North of North Avina of Algeria, uh, which happened in fact in 1870. Um, in my view, so here as well, I mean, there will be you know many ways of of making this notion of convertibility and inconvertibility uh, um, relevant, but I want to emphasize one thing: is that one of the conditions under which this um, um, so-called assimilation, right, happened is because of something that happened in the metropole, which was the reform of, of French Judaism by Napoleon Bonaparte, right? Which I think is not just a Christianization in my view, but is really this vertical way by which the French state uh, um, reorganizes and literally invents what they call le culte, right? Le culte meaning a religious organization vertically oriented with one representative that can be sort of integrated within the, the body, literally, of the state and um, um, have a wage, right? So religion becomes, um, you know, when a uh, religious office is, is uh, like any other job, right? You, you, you do some work, you have a salary, end of the story. 
uh, which is the foundation of laicite, even though the separation between church and state is also a way of the fun, I mean, of changing the system via uh, um, uh, taking back the money, so to speak, or the funds. Uh, but this is another story. Um, the, what you say about Fanon is, is, is interesting, and I hadn't ta thought about that um, in this way. Um, and I must think more about that, to be, to be really honest. Of course, Fanon is, is, is very important, but in the meantime, there are many blind spots, and we shouldn't you know, sacralize him uh, by, by, by no means. But um, there is something he says in Black Skin, White Masks, which is interesting, is that he sort of contrasts the, the, the specificity of blackness and anti-blackness anti in the West with precisely anti-Semitism, right? And it's not quite clear where um, the, the forms of racialization he will encounter in Algeria where they, where they, where they, where, where they stand. Um, some scholars of race have said that to some extent understanding uh, the racialization of the Muslim or the Arab is a sort of hybrid between anti-blackness and anti-Semitism, which I think is, is, is an interesting path to explore, but in my view, uh, pure exploration. Yes. Uh, can you use the microphone? Because, sorry, can you, yes. I was wondering what you would do with the, what the literature has uh, left for us to digest because there are so many, I mean, I don't think of a major 19th century writer that didn't go for the, it's, I mean, some people had the Voyage de l'Italie and some uh, writers had to go to Algeria mm -hmm. and come back with, to write about what, I'm thinking for example, for Fromentin that uh, distinguishes between uh, les morts et les arabes. I don't know if you remember, I, I forgot the title now of, of one of his works. And, um, and of course, it's not just Fromentin. It starts very early where the notion of uh, race is raised and it's uh, created to create the two pièces in a way. For example, one division is between the Berbers and the Arabs, as if in Algeria they didn't have, I mean, not uh, two, three, four tribes, but dozens. And you can find it in contemporary writers in Algeria, writing in novels, in essays, that remind the Algerians that they have never been divided into two major races. And what I'm, uh, I mean, a question that I would have for you, what do you do with the attempt of the Algerian government after the independence, and it starts with Boumediene saying we are Arabs, in a country that has, I mean, Kourourlis, has the people of the Sahara, and as you know, I mean, there is no one race in Algeria, but even after the independence, it has continued to create this idea that, I mean, in the name of unity, in the name, and generally it was, it's the French that have created the divisions between us. Okay, As if could you come it to was an end just because a matter of, time. of division. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, yes, please. Yes. Oh, thanks. I had a uh, actually a related question, which I was I'm very curious to hear about the place of the Berber within all of this, because I, I know the Moroccan context more than the Algerian, but it's very apparent that the, the racialization of the Berber by the French protectorate becomes part of the, the governance model. And certainly in terms of cultural production, there's a very clearly racialized distinction being drawn between Arab and Berber that's almost, you know, it's very cartoonish mm. at points. So I was wondering how that mm. fits into the question of inc inconvertibility in particular. Okay, um, Farouk, can you come to a microphone and then Aisha? Hi, 
Thank you so much. This was very rich. Two quick questions. Um, one following up on your response to Nadia about uh, theorizing race without theorizing colonization being problematic in the Middle East. And I was wondering if you consider um, um, slave trade routes that kind of fall outside of the colonial rule as a way of following colonization. And I'm talking about that because uh, specifically when you think about um, uh, the Gulf region, uh, you have like, of course, Amman as, as this very important uh, player of like the Indian Ocean uh, slave trade route, but it doesn't necessarily, and, and, and then from there you have like the Iranian blacks of, of south of Iran. So that's one, and I was wondering if you think about that in terms of colonization, not geographically falling into colonial rule. And the second one, you talked about anti-colonial uprisings as metaphysical. And uh, the example that um, kind of like uh, you, you followed up on, on uh, to, make, to, to make your point about metaphysical was the terrestrial uh, forces that they basically talked about nature, right? Um, helping them uh, in their anti-colonial uprising. And then you said, or celestial. And I was wondering how you make that connection. Through that, I was hoping you would talk a little bit more about the uh, distinction between Arabness and, uh, um, and uh, um, Muslims. So, yeah, kind of like the metaphysical being Muslim. Thank you. Thank you. Aisha? Thank you. I don't know if these work. I don't think they work. Anyway, um, thank you so much. No, no, they're for the Zoom, so you need to speak oh, into okay. it. Oh, okay. I just wanted to add up on these questions, like following like Jews, Arab, Berber, like what about Arab Christians and like how that plays out vis-a-vis -vis the European colonizer and the domestic, like Muslim Arab majority stereotype. I don't know the con like the context yeah. in Algeria, but I assume there are Christian Arabs, so thank you. Yes. Okay, I think that's uh, probably enough that's to fill uh, that next five minutes. <laughs> five minutes to answer the questions of Middle East studies. <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to begin tangentially by saying something that, um, which is also the reason why I, I, I do this work and why I added Middle East studies to my um, um, subtitle. There is something that uh, most of the time, uh, and I was struck in fact when I started reading uh, scholars of the Middle East in English, um, is that there is a fact which seems to be ignored, is that the conquest of Algiers in 1830 is a moment when, in fact, the first province of the Ottoman Empire is became, be, being conquered by uh, the European power, which means that what happens in Algeria cannot be seen as just something provincial because it's an inaugural moment, right? But in fact, what happens is that in the Anglophone world, this is put at the margin because it's we don't know really, well, A, it's not really the Arab world, B, they seem to speak a bit too much French, and so on and so forth. So, inauthentic, right? Which is re really what I'm trying to um, uh, challenge. Now, of course, part of this marginalization is, in fact, this divide between the Arabs and the non-Arabs. And I'm saying non-Arabs deliberately. Why? Because, in fact, if you look at the mechanisms via which so-called Arabs and so-called Imaziran, or what we call Berber or Barbar, right? The ways in which this divide is being, is created in Algeria determines in many ways, not the only thing, but it determines in many ways how the distinctions between Arabs and non-Arabs is going to be made later on in other regions of the, the Middle East. Right, which in my view is something that of course has to be discussed. It's not, I'm not trying to say this is what happened, is that this is, this is a chronology that I think one has to take into account even when we think of countries which seemingly have nothing to do with um, um, North Africa or, or, or Algeria. Now of course there is, so this is a way of, of connecting different contexts, but of course, you know, the, the, the question of, uh, of um, yeah, of, of being Amazir, right? Uh, Amazir being the, the one of the words or, or indigenous words to say Berber. I, I have some trouble using the word Berber or Barbar, even though 
it, uh, it's also used in, in Arabic sources. Um, this is a very complex question. I, I wrote an article on this, which was published, I think, in Romes's Review of Middle East Studies, right? Yes. Um, and uh, because I think that the assumption that the French implemented this Kabyle myth, right, or the meat of the, Ber the Berber, is in fact probably itself a myth, right? We have to sort of go back to this literature. You know, the thing is, you know, you would, be, you would have the Arabs and then the French valorized the, the, the Berber and so on and so forth. I think that all this does not have to be taken as for, for, for granted. We have to reopen the dossier, so to speak. Um, and of course, yes, uh, what happens to the figure of the Berber or the Kabyle, right, in the French colonial ethnography uh, of the 19th century um, anticipates, in fact, how uh, French colonialism and, to some extent, other colonialisms see, in fact, non-Arab populations, including uh, uh, sub-Saharan African populations, as precisely convertible, as convertible. In this discourse, in fact, that they use some, you know, of them being secular administrators in France, you can you can find some of their the same kind of discourse among uh, some uh, um, uh, evangelists, evangelical uh, evangelists, yes, um, which is the the idea that Muslims, as Muslims, right, and there, there is in fact a, a difference. Maybe I'll try and talk more about that uh, if I have time is the idea that precisely because Islam is too close to Christianity, it cannot be converted. That is to say, they will not accept conversion, right? Because it's too close. In other words, if some religions, non-monotheistic to begin with, right, what is therefore increasingly called totemism, animism, uh, fetishism, and so on and so forth, well, as soon as these categories are produced, what they mean is that the subject of these religions are in fact convertible, right? So of course you see that there is a distinction, and I'm not trying to say that inconvertibility is the general phenomenon of race. I'm saying that it's a matrix, it's a place where it emerged, of course in, in permanent co connection with constructions of convertibility, but always um, opposed, uh, or uh, always in connection with, with one another. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say, um, in fact there are too many things, but um, the question regarding um, the connection between, or in fact the separation also between, you know, North Africa and the rest of Africa, and therefore a certain idea of Arabness, or North Africa as white Africa, and the rest of Africa, is something that I think um, um, French colonialism has deployed um, very early on, because it needed this for colonial reasons, right? Because Algeria, and this is why they call themselves l'armée d'Afrique, not l'armée d'Orient, right? Not the army of the, of the East, but the, uh, the, the African army, right? The colonial army calls itself that way. Because they see Algiers and Algeria as a point of entry in Africa, right? And if you go back to the, the description de l'Egypte, so back in 1798, there is this idea, in fact, that Egypt is supposed to be uh, um, um, the, the um, if you'd like, the sort of uh, uh, hero, hero also means the rep representative, that is to say the actor of the civilization of Africa, not the French directly, Egypt. And we forgot something, we forgot something in my view, huh? we forgot that before 1882 in Egypt, so before the British Empire colonized uh, um, uh, Egypt, who was there? Right, there were the French. Of course, it was not a colonial regime, but the Saint Simonians I mentioned who were very crucial in implementing apartheid in North Africa, in Algeria, in fact, served in Egypt as counselors, engineers of um, um, uh, Muhammad Ali and, and his uh, successors. There is no possible way, no possible way, that the racial uh, uh, mythology that the French uh, invented between uh, Arabness and blackness did not have an influence among these elites. I think it's just not possible, right? So this is why I, I do not think that we, you, we can use the idea of 
you know, colonization like this. This is why I use the concept of imperiality, imperialities, and colonial imperiality, which is not the same, because if you start saying everything is colonization, then it's done, you're done. I mean, this is the, this is, this is the best way of not talking about col colonialism, right? Yes, well, well, there were always empires. Nonsense, right? Uh, yes, but these empires were not colonial. To begin with, one of the reasons why, or one of the singularities of what we call the West is that there is no empire in the West since at least the 15th century. Why? Because they are empires and they fight against each other. This is the matrix of colonialism, very different from what we call, but by, uh, I mean, is it really an empire as, as the European empires? The Ottoman Empire, it's an Ottoman rule, it's an Ottoman sovereignty, right? Uh, doesn't mean to say they're nicer, right? But it means that it's a different form of power. A different uh, uh, relationship to the land, different relationships to many things. Last uh, uh, thing I wanted to say, yes, well, of course, um, it's quite true that there is, a, that there is some sort of, um, what do you call that, leap? Uh, that I'm making with the usage of this notion of metaphysics or metaphysical, terrestrial, celestial. Well, <clears throat> I'm saying this because of the context of, um, of uh, Algeria at that time and, and taking into account who Abdul Qadir was. That's what I'm, I'm doing. And I don't think, in fact, you could say that they talk about nature. I agree with anthropologists who say that nature was invented as much as religion was, right? So I don't think of it as universal, and I don't think that they have a concept of nature as such different. <clears throat> I just want to emphasize the fact that when you only talk about ecology, right, you're already within a sort of secular modern framework, right? Which is also why people like animism, but they don't like monotheism, right? Uh, because it talks about nature. And the rest talks about God, which is bad, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. I mean, maybe it's less present in the US, but it's very present in, in Europe, and certainly in France, of course. Uh, uh, because Levi Strauss is not dead, but this is, this is something else. Um, so my point is what? My point is that Abdul Kader was a metaphysician, yes. And this is why I use the word. Um, people think of him, and, and people write about him, as a mystic, right? Not really understanding that mysticism is a form of rationality uh, uh, since Al-Ghazali, at least, al at least, right? Who was, in fact, a philosopher. Uh, you know, as Nietzsche uh, couldn't be an anti-philosopher without being a philosopher, right? Well, it's the same. Why wouldn't it be the same, right? So this is why I emphasize that. And just for the anecdote, um, the French colonizers used to destroy manuscripts of Abdul Qadir, right? And of course, there was a huge rise of illiteracy with, along with colonialism. So they, they, you know, Algerians were more literate, so to speak, before colonialism. So yes, I want to emphasize on the fact that not only was he a fighter, not only was he a Sufi of K, you know, but he was a philosopher, right? And I can't think of uh, uh, the 20th century, 20th century anti-colonialism with all the respect I have for Fanon and Nyerere and Krumah and uh, Boumediene and, and whoever, I cannot see this kind of figure, right, who is both practical and theoretical, as they say, right, uh, uh, in, in such a way, even though Marxism has, uh, has tried, but has, in my view, failed. So that's, 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 that's the point. Okay, thank you very thank much, Mohamed. Thank you all of you.